You're listening to What is Black Podcast. I'm your host, Dr. Jacqueline Duget. On prior episodes, I've had the opportunity to speak with wonderful guests about their work to help parents talk with their children about race and address racism. Today, I'd like to continue the conversation by sharing a resource from the American Psychological Association, or the APA, which has had a long history of researching issues of race and racism. My guest today will discuss the APA's Resilience Initiative and how it can help parents address the issues of racism, racial bias, and discrimination. So let's get started with the show. I'm excited to have um, as our guest today, Dr. Lauren Caldwell, Kiana King Chikata, and Dr. Tiffany Towson. Thank you for joining us today. Thank you. Thank you for having us. So if each of you can just um, share a little bit about your background um, and what you do at the American Psychological Association. Okay. Um, This is Lauren. I'll start since you had my name there first. Um, I am the director of the Children, Youth, and Families Office here at APA, which means that I work to ensure that psychology is being used to benefit the lives of children and their families uh, across the whole perspective or a whole spectrum of well-being. And before I came here, um, I was the director of research for the Center on Children in the Law at the University of Florida and a faculty member there. My background is as a developmental psychologist and a lawyer. So that's sort of what brought me into this work of trying to make sure that we're applying the science of psychology to help improve the lives of people most at need. This is Kiana. Um, I direct the Office on Socioeconomic Status, and we work to promote psychology's contribution to the understanding of socioeconomic status, um, as well as the lives and well-being of people who are living in poverty. Um, We really work across the whole spectrum, but a lion's share of our work really focuses on people who are living in poverty or uh, low-income individuals or disparities as it relates to kind of socioeconomic status. Okay, and I'm Tiffany Townsend. I am the Senior Director of the Office of Ethnic Minority Affairs here at APA. Um, And our office really tries to advocate for psychologists and communities of color, ensuring that we use psychology and um, psychological science to um, benefit communities of color, to address issues in society that may be of particular relevance for communities of color. And we also want to try to diversify the workforce to ensure that our psychological workforce um, adequately reflects the diversity in our society. So we provide supports and scaffolding to make sure that students of color come into the field, but that they also are successful and that they graduate so that we can have um, a larger number of psychologists of color who are working in communities that need to be served. Before I was a staff member here, I was on faculty at Georgetown University and Penn State University in the Department of Psychology, where my work really did focus on um, uh, African-American youth and families. Thank you for sharing that, um, that, that impressive background. I first learned, uh, I mean, I've heard of the American um, Psychological Association, but became a little bit familiar with um, the project that we're going to talk about um, today, um, the Resilience Initiative, when um, I was a representative for the American Academy of Pediatrics at a, at a meeting last year um, talking about, um, about this initiative. So I was wondering if you all could, if one of you could, could tell us a little bit more about APA's Resilience Initiative. Sure, I'd be happy to. Uh, So the initiative is really focused around the idea that racism, racial bias, and racial discrimination affects children, and that yields disparities in their education experiences, discipline, their outcomes, overall health, general well-being. And we know that parents wonder what to do in order to help their children process the negative experiences they may have or may see, and to develop strong identities and resilience despite those experiences. So through interactions with their children, parents influence children's racial identity and self-concept and their beliefs about the way the world works. 
and also the strategies they have available and their skills for coping with and navigating racism and the racial relationships and interactions they'll be faced with. So the goal of the initiative then is to provide resources to parents and other caregivers to assist them in promoting street health and well-being among youth of color by supporting the development of positive, positive racial identity that can be such a protective fast factor and bolster success. So that sort of is a long sentence to say <laughs> where the focus of the initiative is and what our goals are. And I thought this was such a such an amazing um, such an amazing uh, resource for parents. Like you said, I think race is you know for some for some families it's it's not a difficult conversation because they have to have the conversation maybe it seems like every day either in response to what's happening in the news or what happened um, to their child during the day or you know parents are just you know just heightened um, just have a heightened sensitivity and awareness of the importance of talking to their kids about race so I wanted to step back a little bit because you all have such an extensive, such an extensive and diverse background. I was wondering how each of you play a role um, in the initiative or creating the initiative. Or sure. So <clears throat> this grew out of a. Uh, uh, APA Presidential Task Force looking at resilience in African American children and youth. Um, and based on that sort of synthesis of the science, there were some recommendations made that um, led us to think about uh, what it is that, you know, we might be able to do or say. And so uh, the three of us started talking. This is a true collaboration, and I'll let Tiffany and Kiona speak to their roles, but uh, we, we talked together about what we might do, how we might utilize the science that we know and the members who are interested in this issue to really try to provide some resources to parents. And it evolved into this virtual center website where we're trying to provide resources and developing other materials to help build capacity and skill um, to support parents in this work. Yeah. So um, as Tiff uh, I'm Tiffany. As, <laughs> as Lauren mentioned, this is a true collaboration, and in many ways it's, it's a, a different, it's kind of a move away from the way APA has worked in the past, um, and we're very excited about this. So we're collabor collaborating across offices to really address an issue and using different lenses to look at the same problem. But we think by having those multiple lenses on the same issue, we can see all sides of the problem or more sides. Let me let me not sound too arrogant, more sides of the problem. And so um, coming from the perspective of, of families and communities of color and then also looking at um, socioeconomic status and kind of developmental issues, I think we have a broader perspective on ways in which we can address um, racial socialization and its impact on kids. Um, and so for us, it's a partnership. Um, we are three directors working together to really try to do something different at APA, reaching out directly to parents. Um, oftentimes, APA as a professional organization, we've kind of worked with other professional organizations and tried to have our impact um, indirectly. And this is our effort to try to really be a resource to a target population. We want to reach out to parents parents of color directly and be a resource to them and help them to really think about the importance and significance of racial socialization and how it could play a role in the well-being of their children. Um, we know that psychology has been in this space for decades. And we have all this literature, we have all this research, but it's not getting to the populations that really need it. I mean, we're speaking to ourselves in many ways. So we write these articles, we have these great findings, but it's not we're not able to permeate um, and get it out into the communities. And so this is our effort to try to take that research, work with our members who are experts in the field, who have been in this space for many years, and work with them to translate it and make it accessible to parents so that they can use it and work um, with their families. APA is choosing to focus this initiative on race and ethnicity, and why not include poverty or include some other social determinants um, to help parents? I was just wondering why, why focus primarily on race 
and kind of tease that out from some other other aspects of identity. So I think that comes from the the idea of why APA, you know, why we thought this initiative was needed, this idea that parents of black and brown children are tasked with trying to teach their children how to navigate and even survive a society that may be hostile towards them, give them messages that undermine the positive parenting efforts parents are putting forth. Um, they have to counteract negative messages their youth receive all around them from the media, the judicial education and health systems, and, you know, uh, just day-to-day -day encounters. And so it, it seems like in the this over the last decade that this was a time where parents had a real need and psychology really has something to say. There's 40 plus years of research in this area talking about how bolstering children's racial and ethnic identity is a protective factor and really helps them, you know, <clears throat> sorry, <clears throat> really helps them be stronger and have, um, you know, strong overall well-being. So uh, while there are many social determinants of health that play a really important role, this was one that we could really pinpoint that there is strong research-based information that could really be useful for parents, but that parents didn't really have access to. And I think, you know, although this was not the only reason, I think kind of the more recent um, focus in social media on many of the race related kind of issues, um, violent kind of attacks and killings that were racially motivated, really prompted, um, really prompted us to kind of look at this task force report and, and say, we have an answer, right? So this task force report happened a while ago, and there were recommendations that happened, and it just kind of dovetailed with some of the need that we saw that was becoming more relevant and more salient, um, given social media attention. I know my office was often getting phone calls from parenting groups and families saying, how can I talk to my kids about these issues? What do I say after a race-related shooting or, you know, a, um, a racial incident that has happened in the news? And so we knew that there was this need, and we wanted to help parents to, to access the resources that we knew that were that was out there, we wanted them to access that research that's been there for, as Lauren says, um, close to over 40 years, to really help them to come up with answers to these problems, to these issues. How do we talk to them? Why should we talk to them? Should we even raise these issues? The answer is yes, and we do need to talk to them openly about race relations in this country. The issue is not race, right? The issue is racism and the fact that race was used to try to perpetuate a system of oppression in this country that the reality is our country was built on. And so we have to raise the awareness about this institutional system um, because kids and families are navigating this system whether they realize it or not. And when they don't realize it and they're trying to navigate it, there's so much damage to, to their psyche for trying to navigate a system that they're really unaware of and don't really understand the rules. So what we want to do is raise the awareness, let them, un let them be clear about what the system is, why it was developed, and how it impacts um, youth development and, and family well-being, and what are some strategies that they can use to address it. Um, so, so we just wanted to, we saw the need, certainly that report was not prompted by some of these more recent incidents, but it was kind of the perfect storm. You know, we had this report, we had these recommendations, we had all this ye all these years of research, and then we were getting folks voicing the need. And so we wanted to try to marry the two if we could. So as a pediatrician and a mom of color with kids of color, I want to thank you for, you know, taking the taking such a I mean I think I think it's important when an organization says that this is important enough for them to make it a a public initiative, right? And say that this is this is part of who we are, this is part of the this is part of what our organization does and is about. And I think that's I think that says a powerful 
sends a powerful message. Thank you. We hope so. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think so. I, you know, I it's just me speaking, but I think um, I think a lot of a lot of other people feel feel the same way. So you mentioned um, Tiffany. You mentioned that there are resources. I think even Lauren mentioned this as well. Resources on the website, um, and I and I. And if you could, if you could um, tell us what the website is, because I, I neglected to do that, I'll definitely put that in the show notes. But what resources are available to parents um, to help um, talk about race or address questions that their kids may have about race? So um, this is Kiana, and um, first of all, the website is www.apa.org/res uh, for racial and ethnic socialization. Um, and so just back to what you said about our, our organization, you know, the mission of APA is really to promote the advancement of psychology to benefit society and improve lives. So this is very much in alignment with the type of um, impact that we want to have in society with this work. And in terms of the resources that we are working to pull together, we are just trying to use psychological knowledge to turn it into digestible and actionable bites. Um, that can be useful for the public. So our hope is that um, what we'll be doing is, or what we're working on is building this clearinghouse of resources for parents and, and caregivers. Um, and we want to um, provide a variety of tools and resources that can be read, listened to, watched, um, provided as a means for reflection, um, and things that hopefully will change people's behavior and, and prompt them to be intentional in their actions around racial and ethnic socialization. And so um, some of the things that we have now are we have a blog series, which is on um, the public interest blog side of Psychology Benefits Society. We also have some tip tools on our website that kind of talk specifically about what parents can do to engage their children around um, racial and ethnic socialization. Um, we also have one around how you use and choose books to discuss race and ethnicity with children. Um, and on that same topic, we have a little video abstract, which is a, a new form of media that we are kind of uh, working on and thinking of ways that we can get this information out. Um, additionally, we have a working group um, made up of psychologists where um, they're working to summarize um, the psychological knowledge specifically around um, identifying, acknowledging, and validating key race-related parental stress experiences, um, recognizing that parents of children of color um, have a different experience and a different level of stress as they kind of navigate through um, these issues. So how do we support those parents in managing their own experiences um, related to racism um, while helping their children learn positive messages about race and ethnicity? Um, so we have some additional products that we'll be planning um, specific to that for parents um, and managing their own stress as they also um, continue to practice uh, racial and ethnic socialization with their children. So we're looking to do more um, podcasts, webinars, and other uh, tools. Um, but the other thing about our website is we are interested in curating resources from other um, sources that are trying to do the same thing. And so we invite people to submit other kind of resources that parents are using. Um, and we also have some interns and staff here that are going to be working on pulling together some additional resources. So however we can be helpful to parents um, as they navigate, you know, their experiences with talking about race to their children and socializing their children effectively um, in, in their communities, in their schools, um, so on and so forth. That's what we hope to do. And I think um, I think the psychological field, whether it's psychiatry or psychologists, have, have like you said, have had a long history. And again, for me, it was it was kind of amazing to learn. I read an article. It was on it was a Twitter article, and then I read the article about um, a psychiatrist, a African a black psychiatrist, African American psychiatrist, who actually, and I think also psychologists as well, helped to even develop Sesame Street. Yes, that's. 
psychologists have been involved with Sesame Street since the early conceptualization. So I will thank you again because I love Sesame Street. <laughs> <laughs> it's a great program. So again, I mean, again, I think this just shows how much of a of a leader um, psychologists have been in this field. And I think my understanding from reading the article was that some of the some of the impetus for developing Sesame Street was to was to also help again this in this area of racial and ethnic socialization, which I found was fascinating. So, and looking at the website, I know currently a, a lot of the a lot of the resources. And please correct me if I'm wrong, because it'll go into my question. Is geared to parents of color, and I'm wondering how you all see the site working for non-families of color or white families, white parents who um, who also are interested in learning to learning to talk to their kids about race. Sure. So. It is currently geared to parents of color and specifically um, African American parents because we feel that there's a great need to start there. But it's true that all families engage in this process and, <clears throat> excuse me, all need to have resources about how best to accomplish their goals with with their children. Um, so we have started here. We plan to expand to other racial and ethnic groups. Uh, but even as the website currently exists, it's, we, we think that a lot of the resources are useful to anyone who might be interested, including parents of white children or uh, Caucasian families. It, you know, if, if, they're, if, you're, if you don't even realize the necessity for talking to your children about race or the effects of not doing so or the effects of modeling potentially harmful behavior, then you're, you're missing a big piece there and you're continuing to transmit uh, ideas and behaviors that contribute to the problems that we see in this area in society in the first place. So we feel like the site is very useful for anyone who wants to come to it to have an understanding of, hey, this is something that's happening as you're raising your child, interacting with your child, you're teaching them about race, whether you're doing it intentionally or not. And that if you do it intentionally and you do it in a way that supports um, acknowledging and understanding and embracing everyone's individual identity and, and their cultural background and uh, all the beauty that that brings to each person, each child as an individual, then you can help to make a better society and help your child be better able to engage with others across the society, regardless of what your personal background or your child's background is. So, you know, we're hoping the site will raise awareness for people about the importance of talking about race, of thinking about race, of being thoughtful about race, and for helping to, you know, our, all of our children understand their own identities, but also the identities of those around them and, and have appreciation for that. So um, we, we think that there will be some particular, some programming and resources specific to white families in the future. There's a great need there, of course, and we could, you know, for lots of good reasons, but that wasn't the place we felt it was most important to start, right? We, we felt that there was a need we were, that was being expressed to us that we needed to start with families of color. How has this work or has the work informed you personally about issues on race or racism? You know, probably had you asked me this question a week or so ago, I probably would answer it very different um, because I felt like, you know, as someone working on a project like this, you know, all of the readings that I've been doing, you know, the webinars that I've experienced and, you know, just all of the research around these areas, I felt pretty confident about, you know, how I was racially socializing my children at home. And of course, we're always careful to talk about to build their self-esteem and make sure that they're proud of their skin color and their hair and, you know, different things like that. But interesting enough, um, we were on a family dinner and we happened to have our neighbor join us. My son is eight um, and our neighbor is nine. Um, he's a white neighbor very close friend of my son's and my six-year-old daughter was at the table along with my husband and we were in a restaurant and we were all just you know playful talking and all of a sudden the kids started saying waffle 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 so they're talking back and forth to one another saying waffle 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 so of course my husband and I are looking really baffled and then we say, 
so what's going on? And they said, oh, this is our secret language. Only we understand. This is how we talk to one another. And so we say, oh, okay. So I turn to my daughter and I say, waffle, waffle, waffle. And then in concert, the whole group of kids turn to me and say, oh, you said a bad word. And so my husband and I are like laughing. We're like, cute joke, you know, so on and so forth. You got us. And then all of a sudden, um, my husband says, mommy wouldn't say a bad word at the table. That's not good table manners. And my eight-year-old son says, yes, she did. She said the N-word. So how, did that, make, how did that make you all feel when you heard that? Oh, I mean, we were, I mean, we, we were in a public place. Um, we had a guest at the table with us. Um, he's looking at me. I'm looking at him. And, I mean, we literally were like deer in headlights. And, again, this is stuff that I read about. And, and um, so the neighbor is going through in his mind, like, all of the swear words and what they start with. So then he says, there's no such thing as an N-word. So then my son is like, yes, there is. And they are going back and forth. So we, so now my husband and I are like, let's stop talking about this. Everyone, eat your food, stop talking. No one, no one says another word. Like we were so ill-prepared in dealing with this situation right then and there. Um, and so I think my, my husband was a little more... Um, agitated about the whole thing. Meanwhile, I was just kind of, wow, thinking of all of the conversations that need to happen, not ready to have these conversations with my six-year-old daughter, you know, all of those, those things I was thinking about. And um, ultimately what we realized is no one knew what the N-word was. Clearly they had heard it somewhere. Um, I, I ended up having to call my neighbor um, to explain to her because I didn't want her, I wanted her to know that her son is now curious about what the N-word is. And I didn't want her to be sitting at a dinner table in some other setting where he might bring that up. Mm. And then interesting enough to me, she says, so Kiana, what do I say? What do I tell him? And again, it, you know, it's, it's a courageous conversation that has to take place. And I was still figuring out um, what, what conversation I was going to have with my son about it, what conversation I needed to have with my daughter about it. And then at the same time, you know, as a white, white ally who also wanted to make sure that she's saying the right thing and having this conversation with her son, like what would that look like? And so it was quite interesting. Um, kept us on our toes. I think ultimately, um, she did talk to him. What I expressed to her is, um, you know, that she can, you know, have the conversation in whatever way feels comfortable to her, but that um, he is definitely curious because of the response, you know, from my husband and I and how we just kind of shut the conversation down and they were going back and forth um, with it. And so um, she did follow up with me. She said that um, initially she talked to her husband and said that, they had agreed that they wanted to have the conversation with him that he should not go searching for the meaning of that word. But then she later on said that they, um, in, in having the conversation with him, explained to him that it's not a nice word and not one that, um, that he needs to know or that he needs to repeat and how it um, hurts other people's feelings and so on and so forth. So that was their discussion. And then with our children, and so then with our children, um, another very difficult decision that we had to make, I felt a little more comfortable having a conversation with my son, who's eight. Um, turns out he heard the word um, in one of the sports teams that he's a, a part of, so not in his classroom or anything like that. Um, but he didn't hear the word. He heard someone say, I now know what the N-word means. So he still doesn't know what the word word is. We did not um, say what the word was, but we talked about it again as a word that's very derogatory 
and um, what it means about race. Um, that it's a word that people use when they're referring to black people and, you know, so on and so forth. So we had that conversation and we asked him also um, not to try to search more about the meaning of that word and that he should not use that word if he hears someone saying, saying you know, the N-word or a word, so on and so forth. Related to that, he should let us know. So that was kind of the conversation. And we actually decided not to broach it with my daughter. <laughs> We just weren't ready. I mean, it was, um, we just weren't ready to have that conversation with her because we also had this feeling like it was going to kind of rob her of a a certain innocence um, to have that conversation with her. It was tough for us to have a conversation with my son, even though we did not even say the word. We did not use the word, which I think had we said it, he probably may have heard it before. I'm not sure. Uh, but again, you feel like in having these conversations sometimes that you are robbing them of a certain innocence that that you you um, that you think that they have. And so it was a very interesting experience, and it just goes to say that you can't really anticipate everything. And as much as you try um, to anticipate kind of the timing of things and the types of things to talk about, that. You know, there's always something um, that can just kind of surprise you and shock you. And so I realized then that I had not been having all of the conversations that I needed to and, and, and had that full comfort level to be able to talk about those things to my children in a way that didn't feel a little shameful, I guess. Um, but, yeah, so that was my story. That was my little anecdote. Thank you very much for sharing um Share how sharing some of your personal insights um, and and how how it's impacted impacted your your role and work with the um, with the resilience initiative. And I think I find it I, I also find it very interesting that I think no matter how how hard it is to separate the two right the work that you do and also your lived experiences they always they always seem to intertwine and braid themselves to each other. And I was wondering like. For for you all for working on this project, a lot of it's a lot of it's very empowering. So I think hopefully that that kind of is helpful. But I'm just wondering how you all sort of deal with such heavy heavy issues of racism, um, racial bias, and try to try to stay positive, knowing that sometimes it can feel. I mean, I sometimes feel like it's a it's a heavy to, it's a heavy topic to to really address, but it's an important topic to address, even as a parent or just just people being a person in general. So this this is Tiffany. I'll I'll um jump in and I certainly welcome Kiana and and Lauren's perspective as well. Um for me, I think there's this idea of kind of radical healing, right? And and the idea is that when you're faced with this um system of oppression, one of the ways that you can heal from it certainly is self care you know making sure that you're um taking care of yourself you you aren't um neglecting some of your needs but the other piece of that is to really kind of address the issue to really be resistant to that system to raise awareness about it to try to find ways to dismantle it that in and of itself is healing so so for me the idea that we're working to raise the awareness of a system that was put in place to disadvantage certain groups of people is empowering, yes, but it's also healing, right? Because I feel like I'm a part of a solution. And so rather than being um, burdened by that or overwhelmed by that, for me, that actually helps me feel like I have a little bit more control. And um, and so for, for me, it, it's actually invigorating and it, it's in many ways healing again. So So yeah, I think I don't get... Um, weighed down with the the heaviness of it. It is a heavy topic, Um, but because we're in there doing something, using our expertise, using our knowledge to try to make a difference, it actually feels good to do and to focus on. Um, Now, of course, 
you know, with anything, you have to make sure that you are not um, neglecting yourself and burnout could be an issue. But for us, for me right now, I, I see it as um, certainly empowering, but also in many ways um, he, um, a way to heal. So this is Lauren, and I, I want to say I think uh, I, similar to similarly to Tiffany, I think I think it is a very, of course, heavy subject, and it can weigh you down. But I was much more weighed down by seeing what's going on and knowing that there were things that might be able to be done to help parents who are trying to help their children and thinking about what kind of role could I play in that and seeing this as a real avenue to try to make a difference and address a need that that I really see and that, I, you know, I get angry about the way society works. I get angry about the system. I get angry about the, you know, the role of, that I see being played out and thinking and try to think about what can be done and how can I be an ally and how can I help make a difference. And so this, this feels like a place to channel all of that energy and, and it's really why I undertook the education that I took and came to the, this job was to be able to, to, you know, make change and to, to have an effect that uh, would be positive for children and their families. So I think also our collaboration helps with that, that um, if I were doing this work alone, I think it would get very weighty and it would get very difficult, but having Kiana and Tiffany as partners helps um, me to be very thoughtful about the work that we're doing and to think about where it might need to go and what role I play in it, but also to have that, to be able to share sort of our experience and you know, what are we trying to do? What are our goals and where we're going and what difference can we make? And when one of us is less energized, maybe another one of us is more energized and it pulls us all three along together. So I think the collaboration has been essential to it for me as well. And I would just add that um, for me it's been, um, it feels more proactive. Like we talk about this and in, in being prepared and um um, being able to cope with racism, whether it be overt um, or more subtle and, um, you know, more so around microaggressions. So it's, I, I would agree with a lot of what Tiffany and Lauren has said, but for me, I feel more prepared. Um, I feel like I'm able to kind of stop and think and, again, um, challenge my own bias, uh, my own kind of quick response to things, and, and think about where that's coming from. Um, and so for me, it's been extremely helpful. Thank you so much, ladies. This has been a great conversation, and I think this is a great resource. We're excited about the initiative, and we're thrilled that, that you think it's a nice thing to share with your audience. Thank you. This was fun as I thought. <laughs> I enjoyed it, and I'm glad we were able to share a little bit of the resources that we have available. Yes, thank you so much for having us. Thank you for listening to What is Black Podcast. We'd love to hear your thoughts about this episode and other episodes. You can reach out to us on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. And as always, remember to tell a friend and let them know that we're on Google Podcasts, Stitcher, Spotify, and Apple Podcasts. And when you're on Apple Podcasts, please remember to rate, review, and let us know how we're doing. Until next time.